Hi, I'm Charles with Anycap. The story begins as a guy nervously rides on a train. When he gets off, he begins to run frantically, but he's found by a group that somehow knows his secret. This group covers the area in smoke, and the man shows his insane fighting skills as he fends off several attackers. The attackers launch several blades at this guy, so he pulls out a blade of his own to fight back. The attackers then use metal needles called Senban, but this guy has crazy reflexes, catching them with his teeth and firing them back at the attackers. Unfortunately, this man is overwhelmed by their sheer number. He is captured when a contraption takes hold of his neck, and he's dragged by a terrifying looking man. This evil guy slams the man into the ground and uses his sword to finish him off. The attackers use a device to confirm that their target has been eliminated, and they leave. Elsewhere, a farmer named Joe enjoys life on the farm and eventually returns home to work on his motorcycle. He plays a game with his young son Kyle, who tries to sneak up on him, and he tells the kid that he has eyes on the back of his head. Joe's wife Sarah shows up, and she can't believe how dirty Joe's face has gotten. Kyle explains that his mask is like the ones that the Oni wear, but they are really bad people. Joe warns him that the Oni might think that he is one of them, but Kyle is sure that his big strong dad will fight them if they come after him. Joe playfully says that he isn't sure if he can win against these fictional characters, but Sarah states that she will take them out for Kyle. Joe jokingly says that he has to hurry up and finish fixing his motorcycle for when Sarah gets in over her head fighting the Oni. Later, a news report details how the man from earlier lost his life, and Sarah seems concerned that it might actually have been the Oni. Kyle is certain that it was them, but it's time for this kid to go to bed. The kid says goodnight to his mother, and Joe reminds him that his birthday is coming up. With Kyle fast asleep, Joe diligently checks the security cameras he has around his house. Sarah is concerned because of how the man was eliminated, and what's even more bothersome is that no information was found about who he is. Joe tells her that there is nothing to worry about, and assures her that no one will find them out in the middle of nowhere. Sarah is most concerned about someone called the Reaper, but Joe explains that this can't be him since he always worked alone. The next day, we get a glimpse of how cautious Joe is about hiding their identity as he wipes away their fingerprints from a door handle. The young family then goes on enjoying their peaceful life like normal, and Joe does his best to be a good father as he cheers up his son. One night, it is reported that another person lost her life at the hands of a mysterious organization. This marks one of several that has occurred recently, so a large-scale investigation is underway to find out what is happening. On Kyle's birthday, the loving family enjoys a nice cookout. They all joke around while they sing songs, and Kyle blows out the candles on his favorite type of birthday cake. Kyle opens a present to reveal a video game, and Joe gives him a new helmet as well. Joe prefers this one over the scary Oni mask, so Kyle declares that he's no longer a bad guy, he is now a hero. Sarah points out that she just likes seeing his normal face, and the entire family shares a warm embrace. They couldn't be happier, so they all tell each other how much they love one another. That night, Joe gets up from bed, but he calmly tells his wife to stay there. Joe makes his way downstairs, where everything seems fine. Just then, something appears in the window, and Joe is attacked. The attackers barge in, but Joe masterfully fights several of them off. His exceptional skill allows him to take one of their weapons, and he uses his sword to eliminate several of these men. While he's destroying one guy, Joe hears his son cry out to him. The alert Joe instantly springs into action. He blocks an attacker who tries to stop him and absolutely destroys this guy. Joe rushes to find his family as he reaches for something, but another attacker fires two metal needles right through his neck. The determined Joe refuses to let that stop him though, so he crawls up the stairs. The crippling pain overwhelms him, and we see a mysterious figure outside. Joe eventually makes it to the second floor, where he finds that several attackers have been eliminated. However, Joe is then horrified when he sees Kyle and Sarah's lifeless bodies on the ground. Overwhelming shock fills Joe's body, and the evil-looking guy explains that Joe's wife put up a good fight. This monster sends his blade right through her neck, igniting Joe with blinding rage, but he is stabbed in the back. Joe drags the attacker as he tries to make his way to his family, but the damage to his body is too much to overcome. The attackers find that someone must have alerted the authorities, as police sirens can be heard in the distance. The leader confirms that Joe is no longer alive, so they leave just before the police arrive. The police arrive at the scene and are horrified to find the massacred family. Sometime later, the seemingly no longer alive Joe regains consciousness. His first thoughts are memories of his lifeless family, and he vomits solely from the overwhelming emotion consuming his body. The next time Joe wakes up, he is in a hospital and the nurse urgently calls for a doctor. 
Joe only says his wife's name and he passes out again. Joe eventually wakes up and a doctor explains that he miraculously came back to life after the coroner had already pronounced him dead. Joe couldn't care less and just wants to know about his wife and son. Unfortunately, he is told that they didn't make it. Outside, we see that two people have come to visit him. They are Mike and Emma and they are from the FBI. They want help with their investigation, so they ask several questions about who the attacker might have been. Joe doesn't say a single word, but Mike can tell that he is getting very angry. This is probably the worst time to be asking him questions, so Mike just leaves his card. Mike tells Emma that it's just a hunch, but he believes that Joe knows who the attackers are. He decides that they will take turns watching him, and Emma is first up as she watches Joe on the roof. Joe has a memory to just moments ago when he was taken to say goodbye to his family. The nurse found that he couldn't move Joe anymore, and it was because Joe put the brakes on the wheelchair. Joe shook with rage and couldn't bear to come any closer to his deceased family's bodies. Back on the roof, memories of his wife and son rush into his mind, and Joe begins to growl in anger. His rage reaches its boiling point, and he reaches for his wrist again, this time pulling out a metal needle. Joe pierces himself with it, and it does something strange to his body. Just then, Joe is attacked by several assassins. He is still filled with anger, so he goes berserk and expertly takes out several of the attackers. Joe shows overwhelming strength and precision as he somehow manages to take control of the fight. That isn't all though, as Joe does some kind of jutsu and turns his body into a black smoke. This move is incredibly powerful as it allows him to eliminate several assassins in one instant. Emma has no clue what's going on, but Joe doesn't help her find out and knocks her out instead. The enraged Joe then continues his relentless attack and goes on to tear several more attackers to pieces. There are a great number of them, and Joe strangely fires a sword at the elevator. We then see why he did this, as he uses a pole to defend himself, and shoves all the remaining assassins into the elevator. Even though Joe is severely outnumbered, it becomes very clear that the assassins are trapped inside with him, and not the other way around. Joe stands above all their corpses, as he arrives at another floor, and he strikes fear into the hearts of any remaining opponents. Mike wonders why Emma isn't answering his call and is shocked when he finds several corpses. Joe finishes up nearby and he is found by the assassin leader. Memories once again find their way into Joe's mind, so he attacks the leader with fury. This leader is obviously not like the others though, as he defends himself well and even manages to put a contraption around Joe's neck. Joe quickly frees himself, but the fight continues to be evenly matched. Joe eventually uses his shadow skill again though, and it allows him to land a devastating attack. Joe quickly follows this up with even more strikes, and the fight is over soon after. Joe demands to know how they found him and his family, and how they knew it was really him. The leader mockingly remarks that Joe can change his appearance as much as he wants, but he will never be able to escape his fate. Joe then shocks this guy, and removes his disguise. Joe doesn't say a single word from here, and just ends the leader's life. Joe then goes to see his family. He can hardly bear to look and he collapses to his knees. Afterwards, Joe returns home and drills a hole into a wall. He removes a box he had hidden and we see that it contains several items including a mask. Joe stares at a picture that once again floods his mind with memories of his family. We get one last look at his family home just before Joe sets it on fire. Joe watches as his once love-filled and peaceful life burns away and he puts on the mask. The fire consumes every last memory, but we see that Joe is still filled with anger. Later, Joe relives the horrifying moment when his family died. This time, his wife calls out to him by his real name, Hegan. His family no longer has on their disguise, and Joe's son screams out to him. Just then, Joe wakes up from the horrifying nightmare, and we see that he has tied up the assassin leader. Joe is in real bad shape though, and collapses. Joe is surprised to hear that someone has arrived, and this man is just as shocked as he thought the next time they would see each other would be in the afterlife. This man is a doctor, and he wonders why Joe isn't wearing his disguise. Joe reveals that the organization somehow found a way to see through the masking system they were using. The doctor wonders why Joe's body always gets beat up, but he then realizes why when he sees Joe's arm. Joe used the secret art of stark awareness, which explains what he did when he stabbed himself on the roof. The doctor tells Joe never to use it again, since it will surely end his life next time. When he sees Joe's back though, he tells him to forget about next time, since he should have died from when he was stabbed. Joe has no clue why he was able to survive, and the doctor wonders if someone out there is keeping him alive. 
It will take six whole days for Joe to make a full recovery, but he just wants to get well enough to get answers out of his guest that he has all tied up. The doctor wonders what Joe plans to do after that, and his answer is simple. He will hunt down everyone responsible for the murder of his family. The doctor gives Joe something to help him recover, but it hurts a whole lot and he passes out. After Joe recovers a bit, he goes to see the assassin leader. Joe doesn't say a single word and just gets right to plunging a blade into him. Joe stabs him several times, but the man reminds him that ninjas never crack. Joe shocks him when he points out that he already knows and just continues stabbing. Joe doesn't stop as days pass and the assassin eventually tries to ask what Joe is trying to prove. He pleads for Joe just to end his life already, but Joe just ignores him. Several more days pass, but Joe is not finished and he keeps causing the guy pain. One day, Joe douses him in gasoline. The assassin starts talking real crazy and wishes Joe would have seen the look on his wife's face. The assassin was not impressed with Joe's son since he was just scared like everyone else, but Joe's wife was different. Her eyes were filled with anger and hatred till the very end. This psycho pushes even further and tells Joe that his wife cried more and more every time he plunged his sword into her. Joe calmly tells him to listen closely and he explains that he's going to burn his family's eyes into his memory forever. He then goes on to describe the incredible pain he's going to make him feel. Joe tells him that he will never really have this sweet relief of death as he will always have to tremble in fear of the oni that lie beyond. Joe lights this guy on fire and he just watches as the assassin screams in agony. Elsewhere, Mike is taken off the investigation regarding Joe Logan. It's an order from the higher ups as they are upset about what happened at the hospital. There were no cameras on the roof and they don't know who the blood belongs to. Mike points out that Emma saw everything, but his boss suggests that he ask her again since she seems to have changed her story. Mike is furious with Emma for just giving up, but she laughs at how obvious it is that the higher ups are trying to cover this up. Something shady is going on, and she knows that the best course of action is to just act obedient. In secret though, she has been investigating Logan and his family. She has discovered that they were all using aliases, and none of them actually exist. Back with Joe, he takes a look at the device that creates his disguise, and thinks back to how he was told that it would protect everyone. He then rides off on his motorcycle to begin his search, but finds that the first place he checks is empty. Joe would go on to travel long distances to check other places, but all he ever found was disappointment. The last place he checks is empty as well, and his frustration begins to mount. That night, some corrupt cops enter a bar, and they get upset when the bartender doesn't give them enough money. Joe is sitting right there, and one cop thinks it would be a good idea to ask him if his motorcycle outside is stolen. Joe just ignores this guy, so the cop asks for his license. Joe ignores him again, so the cop tries to grab him, but Joe quickly knocks him out. Joe calmly just leaves, but the other cop tries to attack him from behind. Joe doesn't even touch the guy when he throws a punch, but the sheer force from Joe's swing sends the cop flying. Outside, Joe takes a look at their cop car and is reminded of the business card that Mike gave him. The next day, Mike thinks Emma's just messing around, but she points out that she is investigating a crime. Many criminal deals are being done in virtual reality now, and she has to get this job done so they can have time to investigate Joe. Emma then explains that advancements in VR have exploded like crazy recently, and it's all thanks to the Auza company. Just then, Mike is shocked when he receives a call from Joe. He gently gets Emma off of VR and signals for her to track the call. Mike tries to get Joe to tell him who he really is, but Joe has questions of his own. Joe wants to talk, so Mike points out that they are talking, but this just makes Joe break his phone. Joe calls Mike back to give him one more chance, but warns him to stop messing around. Joe lets him decide where they should meet, so Mike chooses some restaurant. The call ends, but Emma's disappointed as she failed to track Joe. As Joe makes his way to the restaurant, we see that ads for Auza are everywhere. The ads claim that Auza technology protects everyone, and it's so important that people need to have it in every aspect of their lives throughout the entirety of their lives. Joe arrives near the restaurant and scopes it out as Mike gets there. In the restaurant, Mike tells the owner to take a walk. The owner begrudgingly agrees to leave, but tells Mike to direct any delivery guys that show up to the table by the door since that will be where the food orders are. Joe finally arrives, but Mike wants to see his face so he can confirm that it's really him. Joe shows him the business card he gave him instead, but that isn't good enough for Mike. Joe decides to just leave, but Mike agrees to speak with him. Joe just wants to know who's responsible for the serial murders that have been happening recently, and he agrees to answer any questions Mike has in return. Mike is glad to hear that, but this crazy cop then pulls out his gun. He reveals that he isn't the type to make deals with suspects and tells Joe to get on his knees. 
Just then, a delivery guy comes in and picks up one of the orders. Mike wonders why Joe didn't use that moment to run away, but Joe still wants to talk. Just then, another delivery guy picks up another order. Mike tells Joe not to try anything as he cautiously makes his way around the table and he declares that Joe is under arrest. Joe doesn't move an inch, but Mike gets annoyed when a third delivery guy comes into the restaurant. Mike gets confused when he notices that there are no more orders that need to be picked up and this delivery guy goes in for an attack. Joe quickly springs into action to stop the strike, but his face gets exposed and Mike wonders who he is. Joe finds himself in a fight, but it's clear that this attacker is no delivery guy. Mike tries to arrest them both, but he must open fire when the fake delivery guy goes to attack him. Joe has to save him from being killed, and the fight intensifies when the attacker reveals that he has another set of arms. Joe gets pushed back, but he uses his shadow jutsu thing to bring forth four arms and two heads. The intense battle continues, but Joe simply has more arms than this guy now, and he takes hold of him. Joe pushes him back and prepares to end the fight, but he realizes that the guy's extra set of arms was actually a whole nother person that was just hiding in his bag. This second guy attacks him from behind, and Joe does his best to fight against these two deadly opponents. Joe then once again saves Mike and tosses some alcohol at the assassins. Joe sets his swords ablaze, and the dangerous fight rages on. Joe eventually chugs some of the alcohol and uses it to shoot a fireball at his opponents. He takes this opportunity to launch all his blades at them, pinning one guy and absolutely destroying the other. The insane fight is over, so the stunned Mike pleads for Joe to tell him who he is. Joe just says the words pecking duck, but Mike gets upset since that is just one of the items on the restaurant's menu. Mike wants to know where the guy from the hospital is, so Joe uses the device to show him his disguise. Joe reveals that he is a ninja. These fake delivery guys were as well, and so were the guys at the hospital. Just then, the two of them have to take cover as the group shoots at them from outside. Things get even worse when they look outside as one of the attackers fires a rocket at them. The entire place explodes and the attackers take off. Joe is nowhere to be found, but we see that he's up above watching Mike. Mike looks at his chest to see that the ninja's blade cut right through his body armor. The blade doesn't even have a single scratch on it, even after the entire fight with Joe, so Mike wonders who could have made such a crazy weapon. Just then, the ad for Auza pops up behind him, and both guys stare at it as it makes its pitch for why everyone needs Auza technology in their life. Elsewhere, a man named Zai informs his master that their target is unfortunately still alive. The master is upset by this, and says Higan's name. Elsewhere, a politician makes his escape as his home was just attacked. He begs for God to stop the demons, but things get terrifying when he begins to hear something. Just then, a few terrifying hands come out of nowhere and end their lives. The man responsible watches nearby and seems to take a strange liking to Joe, who he has a picture of on his phone. Afterwards, this guy is visited by Master Yamaji. He complains that this last job was extremely boring and declares that his talent should be reserved for more exciting missions. Yamaji reminds him that he is simply a sword and weapons like him have no will of their own. Yamaji then states that exiles like Higan are no longer considered ninjas. They are treated as enemies the moment they leave. They must be eliminated immediately as they can't afford to have anyone find out about their secret arts. Higan is one of the most elite ninja in the entire history of Japan. He has mastered countless fighting techniques and is completely ruthless when it comes to eliminating his targets. They already killed him once, but they believe that he was able to survive because he used his secret art. Yamaji wants to eliminate him for good this time, as he wants to find a way to uncover Higan's technique. Yamaji has already ordered preparations for this, but the other guy is more concerned with the one known as the Reaper. Elsewhere, a man in red is disappointed to see that someone named Zai has forgotten everything he taught him about fighting with pride. What he does now is just violence, so the man wonders how many of his former comrades he has killed now. Zai is eliminating the ones exiled from the corrupt organization, but this guy brings up how they failed to kill Higan. Higan proved that those who have faith in the old ways will not fall to the likes of people like Zai. The man in red is sure that once the other exiled find out about that, they will stand against the organization just like he is. The man in red was the one that taught Zai how to wield a blade, but now he must put an end to what he started. He unleashes an insanely powerful strike and tells Zai that it's impossible to defend against a blade of wind. This is his secret art called the Flying Swallow. Zai is still alive, but the man is sure that won't be the case for much longer. He plans to use the attack again, but he realizes that Zai's sword is missing. 
A look at his chest reveals that Zai somehow managed to stab him and he is defeated. He is prepared to go to the pits of hell where he will wait for Zai. Back with the other guys, Yamaji reveals that he has forbidden the Reaper from engaging with Higan. At the police station, Mike is told that the attack at the restaurant was just the mafia. Mike is furious at how obvious the cover-up is and he is called by his boss. Mike is reminded that he will be retiring soon, so it's recommended that he not mess it up by sticking his nose where it doesn't belong. His boss wants him to stay home until his retirement day and he leaves Mike with some papers. Elsewhere, Joe is at a hideout and starts a fire. He is once again haunted by the memories of his family, so he must take a moment to calm himself down. Mike arrives to meet him just as planned, but he points out that the restaurant owner was framed. He wants to do something about that later, but for now they will enjoy some pecking duck. Inside, they go over what they know so far. The blades used in the attack were made of a special alloy, and the patent on that alloy is held by Auza. There is clearly a connection between them and the ninja, but Mike still needs to do more digging to find out more. Auza is a very dangerous company though, as they have the FBI in their back pocket. Joe couldn't care less about how dangerous they are. They killed his family so he declares that he will now hunt down every last one of them and make them pay. Mike reminds him that he will have to arrest him if he does that, but decides that there are a lot of other dirtbags that he needs to handcuff first. Mike isn't ready to retire just yet, so he burns the papers and makes a truce with Joe. Joe pours him a drink and explains that this is how alliances are formed. This isn't alcohol though, since Joe just prefers drinking energy drinks. Mike is familiar with someone that knows a thing or two about Auza, so they go to meet with Emma. Mike teases her for her piece of junk car, but she's quick to point out that his car is even worse. Joe proves to be a serious car enthusiast as he knows everything about her beetle, but he's shocked to hear that she knows he is a ninja. Mike explains that he can trust her, but he must quiet her down when she starts talking too much. Emma has them squeeze into her tiny car and shows off all the tech she has installed in it. It's practically a giant moving computer that she built all by herself. Her research has revealed that Auza is a multinational company involved in the development of military weapons. That's not all though as it also has its hand in entertainment, clean energy, and pretty much every technology that exists. It's like they are taking everything over as their products are constantly replacing various software and hardware every day. Every country uses their technology to some extent, but that rapid growth has caused a lot of dark rumors to spread about them. Several people who were inconveniences to their company, like key figures in rival organizations and journalists investigating them, have died in mysterious ways. The most recent person was the bald politician that died earlier in what they think was a car accident. He refused to allow foreign companies into his country, but the guy that has replaced him is doing the exact opposite. He's actively attracting foreign companies, and one of them is Auza. These deaths seem to be far too convenient for Auza, so she suspects that they are behind it all. Elsa, some scientist shows their boss a remarkable reactor. It's performing even better than the last time they tested it, as it's now capable of producing 2.2 million kilowatts of power per second. The boss proclaims that this technology will change the world, and he declares that Auza must become the one and only company. Their technology will make everyone's lives better, and Auza will be the new standard for the entire world. Afterwards, he is met by Yamaji. Yamaji shows him a picture of the restaurant attack, and the man confirms that those were his men. He explains that he was just running a test for a new weapon, and he thought a ninja would be the perfect test subject because they have superhuman abilities. Fearing Yamaji's rage, he points out that he targeted an ex-ninja, not one that belonged to the organization. He tries to remind Yamaji that they are partners, but Yamaji just tells him never to do that again. Elsewhere, Emma shows the guys the center of the huge enterprise known as Auza. Auza City is an experimental city run entirely by the organization. Just then, Joe keeps Mike from getting a blade through his skull as they come under attack. Emma tries to get them out of there, but a sword keeps piercing the car. Mike fires at whoever is on the roof, and Joe does some ninja stuff to sense where their attacker is. He sends his own sword through the roof, but Truck Hoon smashes right into them. Joe finds that the other two are unconscious and he sees the attacker outside. This crazy ninja launches a ton of blades at him, so Joe goes out to fight this guy. He is wearing some kind of strange mask and he gives Joe a run for his money as they make their way up a building. This guy manages to push Joe back a bit and shows that he has a bunch of mechanical arms with cameras at their tips. These things detect Joe as the enemy and Joe finds himself in a tough spot as he gets injured. Joe uses his shadow ability again to summon more arms of his own. 
The enemy takes a hold of him, but Joe manages to take advantage. Joe slices up some of this guy's missiles, but he has even more firepower hidden in his face. The insanely skilled Joe manages to dodge his missiles mid-air and ends up absolutely destroying this guy. A sword through his head isn't enough for Joe, so he takes the guy's camera and throws him off the roof. Joe knows that someone is watching and signals to them that they are next. An ambulance comes to get Mike and Emma and Joe gets a phone call. He is hesitant to pick it up, but once he does, the voice on the other end explains that he is glad that they can finally talk. The voice calls him by his real name though, and Joe is shocked. This person refuses to reveal who they are, but they know that Joe is planning to go to Alza City. He warns that the entire place is protected by a multi-layered security system, and declares that it will be impossible for Joe to get past it alone. Of course, Joe doesn't trust this guy, but he is then shocked when the mystery person recites a ninja poem. The man explains that he's also an exiled ninja, and if Joe really wants to fulfill his objective, then he should wait for him at a certain location. At a hospital, Mike takes a look at a drawing that was drawn by his daughter. A look into the past shows that Mike was always busy with work, so he rarely had time to answer phone calls from his wife. One day, Mike answered because she was calling a lot, only to find that she had terrible news. Mike's daughter lost her life in a car accident, and his wife was completely distraught. Mike's unavailability made her realize that she could no longer handle being married to an FBI agent, so she left him. Now Mike can only stare at the drawing of his once happy family, but he's interrupted by Joe. Joe tells Mike about the person that wants to help him, but Mike is skeptical. Joe is too, but the guy knew a poem that was only passed down in the old organization. Emma confirms that the guy was right about Alza City's terrifying security system, since her research has revealed that you would practically have to be a ghost to get past it. Mike fears that it might be a trap, but Joe simply says that he will kill everyone trapping him if that's the case. This situation is even more difficult as Mike knows that his boss is watching him, so Emma thinks they should just quit trying to break in there. Instead, she has found a community on the dark web that has been keeping tabs on the Alza Corporation. They think Alza is building weapons of mass destruction as they are trying to take over the world. The site admin is apparently one of Alza's former researchers, so Emma thinks they should go question this person. Mike doesn't want her to go though, and he explains that a job like this is for old timers with nothing left to lose. However, Emma refuses to let him go alone. They are on the verge of uncovering Alza's dark secrets, and the information they find might be worth millions. Joe begins to leave, but Mike wants to know if Joe's wife knew who he really was. Joe informs him that she did, since she was also a ninja. In order for them to be together though, they had to break a code. A code that says ninja must be emotionally detached, even from their allies. Mike realizes what kind of person Joe is, as this means he broke the code and chose his family. Elsewhere, Alza executive Joseph is very impressed after hearing that Joe was able to survive the last attack. Even just one of the mass-produced units could destroy an entire army platoon, but they were no match for Joe. The assassin named Lil wonders if Joseph is going to get involved with the actual fighting, but Joseph is only interested in collecting data. Lil says some pretty perverted stuff, so Joseph's bodyguard named Lily offers to shut him up. Joseph gets the meeting back on track by pointing out that Joe is headed to the city, but he is reminded that the security system is impenetrable. Joseph wants to hear Big D's opinion, but this guy is really vain. He only cares about his fade and warns that he will destroy anyone who tries to mess it up. Lil says some more perverted stuff, but Yamaji uses his power to silence him. He explains that they will learn what Joe's secret art is and eliminate him after. Joe refuses to be bossed around by someone who is not his boss, but he does agree with the plan. Afterwards, Joseph reminds Dilly that he teamed up with their group because it would help with his research. Right now, he's only concerned about getting data on his prototype, so he hopes that Joe doesn't die too quickly. Elsewhere, Zai eagerly awaits for his master to give him the order to eliminate Hegon. The master refuses and explains that he will just send the others after him. Their deaths won't matter to the organization, and it's only a matter of time before their goal is achieved. A look into the past shows a trio of ninja on a mission. We hear the ninja codes being recited, and the first is to never divulge the secrets of the ninja. The next one is that ninja must be emotionally detached, and the third is that their missions must take precedence over their own lives. This trio of ninja finish collecting the information they were after, and their mission is complete. Afterwards, a ritual is held in recognition of the trio's skill as shinobi. 
It is a tradition and they are all given names, Zai, Higan, and Mary. That is an all though as they are all shocked to hear that a secret art will be passed down to each of them. They must keep it a secret forever and they all agree. The man in charge is sure that they will be the ones to lead their village into the future and we see that Yamaji was there as well. Later that night, Joe points out that having names will now mean that they will always be able to remember each other. They decide to celebrate with a drink, but Joe reminds Zai not to accidentally reveal his secret art. Zai would never do that and he declares that it can be a surprise if they ever ended up fighting each other. Zai seems like a pretty cold guy, but he declares that the bonds they have made together are thicker than blood. They all then make a pact to risk their lives together to do what must be done. They all have a drink, but then share a laugh when Joe can't handle his alcohol. After that, the trio goes on another mission. Everything goes well at first, but Mary eventually hesitates when she sees a child and she ends up getting shot. She is badly injured, so she tells Joe to just leave her behind. He decides to protect her instead and jumps out the window with her. Joe manages to resuscitate her and he takes her to a nearby cave. Mary wants him to get away on his own, but he once again refuses. Mary tries to take her own life, but Joe stops her. She makes one last attempt to beg him to leave and reminds him of the code that says they must detach themselves even from allies. Joe's Riz then goes off the charts as he states that from the moment he met her, he had already broken the code. Mary stands no chance at resisting his words and they share a tender moment. Sometime later, Zai manages to find them and they are in bad shape. Back to the present, we see that things have changed quite a bit as Zai no longer looks the same. Elsewhere, Mike gets a call from his boss. He informs Mike that he can do whatever he wants since he is not in a case, but things are different for Emma. Afterwards, Emma apologizes for not being able to go with Mike to see the admin, but he points out that he was trying to figure out how to get rid of her anyway. Elsewhere, Joe waits to meet with the mystery person, but the guy ends up calling instead. He explains that Alza City has its own technology everywhere, and that includes sensors along its entire perimeter. These sensors check to see if people have permission to enter the city, and if they don't, they are given a warning. If these people don't heed the warning, then the system will simply eliminate them. As if that weren't enough, the airspace above the city is fully covered by a barrier, and it only allows rain and wind to pass through it. Getting in above ground is impossible, so Joe will have to go below it. There is a facility used to manage the sensors, and the man sends Joe all the information he needs. The place is covered in security cameras and laser traps, but they also have mercenaries who patrol each section. It will be difficult, but the plan will only work if Joe avoids all combat. If Joe can make it past all that, he will eventually reach the barrier into the city. The man will shut off the power, but it will only last for 5 seconds. Any longer and the alarm will sound. He reminds Joe that he will only have 5 seconds and it will be his only chance. At a restaurant, Emma shows Mike what the admin looks like. His name is Jason and she hopes that he hasn't changed his appearance. Mike says that he will be able to find the guy regardless and he will teach Emma his little trick for doing so later. Emma won't be going with him so she just asks him to be careful. She still has a lot to learn from him and just hopes that he will keep her under his wing. Mike eventually leaves but we see how close they are as Emma reminds him of his daughter. At Alza City, the mystery person has shut down all the security cameras giving Joe 8 minutes to begin infiltrating. Joe heads underground and the man instructs him on exactly when to move in order to avoid the mercenaries. Joe does exactly as he says and uses his amazing athletic ability to avoid being found. The guy even tells Joe the patterns for when the lasers change, but they still put his physical abilities to the test. Just as he is about to clear the lasers, a tiny drip of his sweat touches one of them and the alarm sounds. Joe can't turn back now, so he is forced to eliminate several mercenaries and move forward with the mission. Joe makes it to the barrier and the man shuts it off. However, just then Joe is shocked as he is pushed back and Zai is standing there. The two acknowledge each other by saying their ninja names and the barrier turns back on. Joe tells Zai that Mary is dead and he demands to know if the order to come after them came from Yamaji. Zai has no answer for him and simply explains that those who try to cheat death still remain in its shadow. Zai proclaims that Joe will die and he leaves. Mike arrives to meet the informant, but he's pretty skeptical of the chosen place. Emma points out that the top brass at the FBI are definitely watching them, so Mike should only contact her in emergencies. Mike enters the rundown arcade and meets with a guy named Jason. 
Elsewhere, Yamaji is informed of the break-in. The one named Asuka is still analyzing why the barrier went down, but she assumes that Joe had help on the inside. Lil just wants to take him down already, but Yamaji explains that it would be foolish to attack him now. Lil is a real psychopath, as he suggests that they just let Joe into the city. They have their entire force there, so Joe's secret art won't mean anything when he gets beat down by them. Asuka fears that the commotion will look bad for Auza, but Joseph actually likes the idea. They agree to lead him somewhere into the city, and Joseph can't wait to collect some data. Joe's inside man tells him that they have decided to let him inside the city, but it's clearly a trap. They are deploying highly skilled ninja to eliminate him, and the guy is sure that Joe will die if he tries to fight them. He suggests that Joe doesn't go, but Joe has already made up his mind. He will eliminate Yamaji and everyone else. This is why he came to the city in the first place, and he might never get another chance. The guy tells him to move at 7 o'clock, since the city will be throwing a parade to cover up the fight that will take place. Back at the arcade, Mike tries to get some information, but Jason is more concerned about how he was found. Mike just ignores the guy and finds his hidden passageway. Inside the city, the parade begins, and we see that Joe is in the surveillance room. He makes his way into a tunnel, as Joseph and the others watch him. Once Joe enters the tunnel, he is of course met by several deadly ninja. Jason brings Mike to his secret room and tells him that he plans to take down the entire company. He holds a serious grudge against them since they practically forced him to leave the company. Mike wonders if this guy has some kind of personality problem, but Jason says that they were all just envious of him. Jason is digging up all their secrets to expose them, but no one believes him. Mike reveals that he believes the guy and he wants to take them down just as bad. Jason is able to hack into their system, but he hasn't done it since he fears what will happen to him if they find out. Mike assures him that he will be able to protect him, and urges Jason to hack in there. Back in the city, Joe is in full assassin mode as he wipes out several ninja. He uses his expertise to slice them all up and doesn't even take any damage at all. Joe even uses one nasty trick where he loads up a bunch of explosives into one of the ninja's mouths and blows the group to smithereens. The fireworks are doing well to cover up the fight, and we see that Zai is patiently waiting. Back with Mike, Jason has hacked into the Auza system, but hasn't found anything unusual yet. Eventually, they find a list of social security numbers with prices on them. The file is called Bound, which seems to be the name of some corporate spy group. It looks like Auza is buying fake identities so they can plant operatives. This proves that they are corrupt, but they still haven't found anything about ninjas. Just then, Mike is shocked to see Emma's name on the list, and he wonders what's going on. Alarms go off as Jason gets kicked out of the system, and he sees that they have company outside. They take cover as the arcade is infiltrated, and Mike cleverly distracts the intruders. They manage to get away, and Mike realizes that the FBI must have ratted him out. Jason is absolutely terrified, and Mike tells him that those guys were probably mercenaries hired by Auza. Back in the city, Joe continues his assault as he has made his way into a building, and he wipes out several more opponents. Mike tries to contact Emma, but she oddly doesn't answer. Things get pretty bad as they are chased by the mercenaries, and Mike's junk car doesn't go very fast. Mike tries to fire back at the mercenaries, even though he is heavily outgunned, but he doesn't manage to do much. Jason is a lunatic as he gets an idea and manages to get a bus to crash into one of their pursuers. Mike has him slam on the brakes, and he shows off his sharpshooting skills by taking out two of the mercenaries. The car brake checks them though, so Jason must take cover, and Mike fires at the last mercenary. Joe makes his way through the building, and some of the final guards are terrified of him. Joe is a man on a mission, and his breathing gets heavy as his mind is overrun by memories of his family. At the top floor, Joe is met by Lil and some of the other assassins, as they are impressed that he made it this far. Joseph watches and eagerly awaits to see the results of this test. Joe looks at a helicopter and becomes furious when he realizes that Yamaji is watching. Joe screams out to him as rage takes over his body and Joe rushes towards the helicopter. However, he is stopped by one of the assassins. Joe finds that his attacks don't do anything to them and he ends up getting tossed around. Joe uses his jutsu, but Lil is unimpressed by the old and outdated ninja tricks. Joe manages to surprise him with some smoke bombs and shows that his only real target is Yamaji. 
Joe screams Yamaji's name like a man possessed as he launches himself towards the helicopter, but his grapple is severed. The fall does some serious damage as Joe's mask breaks. His mind still runs through memories of his family, and he ominously states that something will happen any moment now. The assassins make their approach, and Joe recalls how the doctor told him never to use his secret art ever again, as it will kill him next time. Joe has nothing left to lose though, as he prepares to remove the needle from his wrist, and he proclaims that he will be together with his family soon. Joe removes the needle once again, and stabs himself with it. Joe's body spazzes out just like last time, and he takes a hit from one of the assassins. The assassins toss him around once more, and Lil taunts him while he's in the air. However, this time, Joe manages to stab one of them. He covers the area in smoke to conceal himself, but he is eventually spotted. Joe is able to maneuver himself in and out of the smoke, and he manages to stab another assassin. Joe's blinding speed allows him to dodge several attacks, including some kind of fireball, and he starts a terrifying incantation. However, before he can use the attack, Joe takes some serious damage from the pink assassin. Lil takes Joe for himself though, and rains punches down on him. The assassins continue to thrash him about, causing Joe to scream in pain, and Lil has already gotten bored by the fight. Just then, Lil stops the beating, as someone has appeared. It begins to rain, and Zai arrives to ask if Joe finally understands. He explains that the path to hell Joe was on is inescapable. Joe can still only think about getting revenge on Yamaji. He mindlessly attacks Zai, but only ends up getting tossed onto the ground. Joe just says Yamaji's name over and over again, so Zai prepares to take his life. Zai declares that everything ends now, and Joe doesn't say a word as he just prepares for death. Zai swings his blade, and everyone watches in absolute shock. Zai stares in disbelief as his attack was stopped by the pink assassin. The assassin placed devices on the others to shut them down, and they jump off the roof of the building with Joe. This assassin detonates a bomb, and the massive explosion prevents Zai from following them. Yamaji's left to watch the failed attack, and Joe's eyes open to see that he is still alive. Elsewhere, we see that Mike is in bad shape, as he must be carried by Jason through the desert. Back with Joe, he is still falling from the building. His hand reaches towards the sky, as if he were reaching for something, but he soon loses consciousness. Thanks for watching my recap. Sign up to my free newsletter if you want to show some support to the channel. Link is in the description.